All right, everybody, this is Ross, the Fig Boss. Today we have another Fig interview, and we have two very special guests, the Burke family. We have David Burke, Priscilla Burke here from the FigHunter.shop. That's their website, and they are really uh, some of the – I think they're – you can just say it. I can say it. They're the best Fig Hunters. They have found so many wild seedlings. It's unbelievable. And so – I would say about a, two months ago at the time of recording at this point, they had sent me a, a package in the mail of different figs that they're growing and have found throughout California. And they sent me a, a, just an assortment of different figs. And it was almost as like I picked them off my tree, guys. I mean, it was crazy how well packaged it, packaged it was. Uh, it came very quickly. Loved the cardboard, the shredded cardboard in there. And then I got to taste them. As if I was in California myself, growing California wild seedlings, and that they were then, of course, pollinated, caprified. caprified. And so it was an amazing experience. I'm not going to lie. I've talked a lot about that in that prior video. And as I had that experience, I learned a lot more from David and Priscilla, and they really opened my eyes. And I wanted to interview them ever since. I wanted to talk to them more, learn about more what they were doing. And I found out quite a bit. And so now we have them on as a, you know, a different format here as we're doing. And I want to really showcase first off what they're doing. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about pollination, this whole caprification thing. What is the fig wasp? Um, and we're going to really clear up a lot of things because unfortunately the, the books that are written on figs, I've read them all from all the experts. And there's just really is not a lot of great information out there um, regarding this topic. And so these guys have really put in the time uh, to learn this. And there's really, really no better person, I think, to ask than I know of. So here we go. We have David and Priscilla Burke. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, if you please tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you're doing and and how you got into all this. And and uh, yeah. Well, who wants to go first? I'll go first, I, I guess. Is, that. <laughs> you asked how we got involved with this. Um, well, I, I typically work away from home. I'm a, uh, a union uh, operating engineer and a union pile driver. So it's um, often that I'm hundreds of miles away from home. And there was one job site that um, had a fig tree. And... It was Friday. I collected some figs. I brought them home to my family. My uh, kids loved them. My wife loved them. It brought back memories from a, a ranch that I grew up on that had a huge, massive, we're talking like know, 70 foot wide, 40 foot tall fig tree with limbs that were 18 inches wide that we use as a fort. And, um, so I picked some more and I started looking into how I could propagate them. Then I started noticing them driving home, fig trees. I was seeing fig trees everywhere. So I started putting dots down on a map and um, here we are today. <laughs> you know, But that's really how it started. Uh, what is today, by the way, guys? Can you explain where you're at right now? So tell us everything you're doing. Well, a lot. <laughs> um, David's currently working down at the refinery, so a lot of it's um, me here at home. But we have been working on propagating. Um, we have probably here on our property in various stages of growth a couple thousand trees, um, most of which are ones that we have found. There are a few that have been gifted to us over the last few years. Um we got to meet some really cool people being in the Smithsonian Magazine um, and doing a couple of news segments and um, just kind of living our best life with our kids. So <laughs> That's good. I love it. <laughs> By the way, Priscilla, she told me she's from Pittsburgh, so we got something in common here. And uh, <laughs> it's just funny, you know, to hear Priscilla talk because it just reminds me a lot of or, you know, the people around me. Um, so anyway, um, you guys are also, I just want to clarify some of the things that you you're doing, like, uh, get really in the details of it. So when I talked to you, David, after getting these, these figs in the mail and tasting them, it was 
clear to me that you were you were taking this a lot more serious than I had ever imagined. And so you mentioned that you're going around, you see the fig trees and you're marking them now on a map. And so you have this, this app on your phone, it's called Onyx hunt, if I'm not correct. Yes. And, um, so you would go around every location that you'd find, you would mark it on the map and, and there's a section there. You can write about them. You can name all the individual varieties that you find in that particular location. And you're up to now, how many locations of figs? Well, this one right here, these, um, is 1882. So that, mm. that is something on the, um, actually on the job site I'm on right now that I've been on. Yeah. I just happened to uh, see it about two months ago. I know that, uh, I finally collected it today for this broadcast to share the fact that, uh, it's a, you know, it's still green here in California. <laughs> it's not completely cold. Yeah, so David, that right there is basically <coughs> a totally new variety that, that just doesn't exist anywhere else in the world because there was a bird that planted a seed, essentially, and the seed grew and turned into a whole new fig tree. And so... The amazing power of the fig wasp, which is called the blastophaga, is really um, a warmer weather wasp. And so it, I've, I've read a study in Hungary that says it can survive down to 12 degrees Fahrenheit, believe it or not. Uh, but for the most part here in the world, it's really in warmer parts of the Mediterranean. A lot of people actually in Germany have been saying, reporting different things and saying that they're even seeing pollination there. Um, and that's a pretty cold place. It's definitely in Hungary. Um, but in the United States, it's really pretty local to different parts of California. And so um, I wouldn't say you would we would probably agree. I think I talked to you about this. That it's not all in all parts of California and maybe it might even be elsewhere. Right. Do you think this wasp is ventured out and um, it's growing? I think you told me. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Well, there were some other breeding programs. I think Texas A&M, uh, Louis Louisiana, LSU had their program. I believe um, New Mexico tried to establish, and Arizona at one point in time tried to establish wasp colonies. Really, the reason why we believe, the reason why it hasn't expanded is there's no home for it. The uh, fig wasp. They live in something called a capra fig. This is a fig that is non-edible. In most cases, it's dry. Uh, it holds the pollen, but it also uh, allows for their gestation. If there's no home for them to go to, mm -hmm. they're going to stay where there is. So if there was on the other side of the mountains, capra figs, it would make sense that eventually um, they would spread. So. so, David, how how does how do they spread? Right, there's four mm -hmm. types of figs. Right, there's the the capper fig, the male fig. There's also the common fig, which doesn't require pollination. That's mostly what people grow. There's the San Pedro type, which the Brava is doesn't require pollination. The main crop does, and then there's the Smyrnas, which do require pollination of the main crop as well. But the male fig is really what's kind of the home you mentioned that is necessary for the fig wasp to expand. Yes. And so if a bird, so if a bird were to essentially get a, a seed from a fig that they ate and then travel a distance and then poop that out, that poop would then have a viable seed that could potentially uh, germinate and expand the area in which figs are being grown. Correct. 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 And so when you plant a seed, by the way, David, there's a 25% chance that you'll get a capra fig. And there's a 25% chance that you'll get all the other types that I mentioned. There's the four types. And uh, I, I, what do you think? Is that, you think that's accurate, by the way? Is it exactly 25, roughly? No. Mm, okay. That gets in the, so we've just hit some, some basics there, A, B, C, and you know, D there. Now you have right. A1, you know, let's break it down here. 
Not only are there capper figs, but there are things called persistent capper figs. These mm-hmm. capper figs hold the genetics for the common fig or a mutation. Um, let's just call the self-pollinating or common figs actually the mutants. That in the Mediterranean, or Mediterranean, sorry, a little bit of a cold here. Um, the Smyrna figs are the common. That's in the, the self-pollinating were the mutants or the hybrids. Well, the persistent capper figs hold the gene for higher percentages of common figs. I hope that mm. I hope I hit that. What that means is they persistent capper fig. The capper fig, which typically is kind of an edible capper fig. Most persistent yes. capper figs are edible. That kind of gives it away. Um, they then can be grown, say, in um, Pittsburgh. You can have a, a, a persistent capper fig because a regular capper fig does require pollination. While they're a great house or um, a home for the fig wasp and they create pollen, they do require the fig wasp to create the figs to help with that process. So there, there is some science with that too, that we're working with a partner that um, believes if you blow air up through the osteal, it will circulate everything and um, make it all work for but the regular cap and figs. There's a little bit more clarification with that too. When he says edible crop, he me or edible cap or fig, he means that one of the crops because cap or figs have multiple crops throughout the year. So at least one of the crops will be edible. Right. So there's the profici, which is te- technically maybe the Braba crop. There's the uh, mamey, which I guess is the main crop. And then there's the mamoni, which is the overwintered main crop Correct. that the, f- the fig wasp will live in throughout the winter time. Mm-hmm. They'll then leave those figs and then go and find profici Correct. to live in. Okay. So it... It's extremely complicated. You can already tell. And so this is why I think um, it's amazing to just have you guys on because, again, like I would never have learned any of this because I don't even have – I have a couple capper figs, barely even pay attention to them. You have seen at this point, you know, you said you're up to almost 1,900 locations of wild seedlings that you found. And that within, by the way, those locations are many different figs. It's not just – one fig per location so you may even have a patch of figs with eight or nine even more trees in it Um, i just found believe it or not off the side of the highway by me a patch of american persimmon and so i was delighted and i harvested 700 persimmons that day um well the following day and i was like a little kid in a candy store and um so in any case i you know it's it's just Again, to the point that you guys are are in this so deep that it it only makes sense that, you know, you guys are the ones to talk to about this. So, David, you said there's two different types of uh, capper fig. There's the persistent, non-persistent. Yes, correct. Is there anything any any other types? Um, well, not that, that we, you know of. Not we really know of, but when we got into that. Now we can actually talk about something else that um, okay. I want to. We're working with somebody that's really into capper figs here. And I have conversations with them probably three times a week with uh, capper mm-hmm. figs. Because capper figs kind of a really, really interesting for us. Without the capper fig, without the fig wasp, there would be no new wild fig trees. So when I'm actually out there traveling around, paying attention, hunting, uh, using the word, I... I love finding capper figs because the possibilities here has been a question for the longest time. Now, capper figs do produce seeds. They usually, typically the fig wasps go in and replace the seed and form a gall. And that's where they, um, they, uh, you know, (laughs) what's the word? (laughs) Yeah. Gestation and all that stuff. So the gall is where Uh the seed would be. 
there is a chance, and it's been proven, that a capra fig can reproduce new fig trees, which the science that hasn't been... This is one of those little little parts of the fig world that nobody's doing the research or not a lot of it because well, why? What benefits does a capra fig bring? But as when you tasted the figs, we showed you a process, uh, um, the Lamont method of injecting through the osteo with that uh, bleeder hole. A simple little thing is putting in a secondary hole when you inject the pollen in, showed almost 99% success rate. Just, um, but that, for an avid collector such as yourself, is like, hey, why am I not going to have a capper fig available to do this? Even if it's just on a few figs. Not only can somebody with, say, a collection of five figs now have 10 figs that they're going to taste because a common fig unpollinated is going to taste different than a caprified. That it's, um, it's not a lot of hard work. No. And I would agree, by the way, it does look relatively easy. Um, and I do think there are going to be some downsides as you probably are aware of to pollination, especially Maybe not where you guys are in such severity, but where I am, if it does indeed increase the size a little too much, that can be a bad thing here. Um, just with the amount of humidity and rain that we get, right. the size of the fruits is, is really a difficult thing. And um, so there's a larger surface area. And also if it's a larger fruit, the drier weather required to kind of concentrate and sort of uh, evaporate some water out of the fruit is much more difficult. Uh, with a smaller fruit, that happens a lot easier. So with the smaller fruit, you just get a more concentrated, more consistently high-quality fruit here. Um, now, as I did get to exp you know experience all of this because of you guys, um, it was clear to me that the majority of us in the in the world should be trying to hand pollinate at least hand pollinate our figs because the flavors that change isn't isn't just unbelievable it's it is um you know the experience that i'm sure you guys have had on your first experience eating a fig was pretty shocking um or maybe you don't even remember that david but you know for a lot of people we have this moment where we're like, holy crap, you know, I can't believe this is a fruit that exists. I never had it my whole life. Now I feel deprived. <clears throat> and so a lot of us have had that experience, but I have been eating figs for the last eight years or so um, off my own trees. And so now it was eight years later and I had the same exact experience. I tasted your figs and I said, for eight years, I've been deprived. I didn't even know what a fig was. I didn't even know what a fig was for the most part. Um, obviously, you can get some really good figs here that are not caprified, and there are some varieties like that that exist, but they're hard to produce here reliably. Um, there are others, of course, that do produce well, and they taste great, but they're few and far between. And so if I can take a good performing fig and caprify it and turn it into something really, really tasty. Well, then to me, it's now way worth growing, you know, to a much higher degree than, than before. And so, uh, there is of course more diversity. Like you said, you had five figs, but if you pollinate some of the figs on the tree, now you have 10 figs that are really totally different. And so that whole learning process that a lot of people are going to inevitably come to, um, is going to be great. I think it's going to be, um, just the standard thing everybody is going to be doing. And I, it, it took me until I tasted your figs to realize that. Well, we really appreciate it. You know, this, um, sharing with you and we shared with a few others this summer was, um, was a blast every year for the past, this will be our third year. So our th third annual, we do fig yeah. get-togethers. We do one in the winter, and we give away cuttings. And we just got to, you know, get together with people. And then we do a summer one where we give away fresh figs. This year, we brought 350 pounds of fresh figs, almost 30 different varieties of figs. 
including wild ones, just to let people see something different. Um, just even in California, most people didn't know that there were these different flavor profiles. Um, Jolly Rancher, uh, Zilon de Blue was just, um, or 276. I, that was like, it was I amazing. Think, I, I think that most people who are not in the fig community, um, their experience with figs is very limited. It's usually either what you can buy at a grocery store for fresh figs, um, fig Newtons, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or dehydrated figs that you buy in a bag. Um, they've never actually tasted a truly, actually most people who have ever bought fresh figs from a grocery store have never actually tasted a truly fresh fig. Um, because even then those figs have to be picked before peak ripeness for shipping purposes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, how many people, Priscilla, back in Pittsburgh that you grew up with even knew what a fig was? Did you even know what a fig was? I mean... We even have in the Northeast, and maybe not in Pittsburgh, but at least New York City, Philadelphia area, we have a huge concentration of people from Italy, and they grew up with these things. They brought them over, and you would think there would be a pretty good idea of what a fig is in this area, but it's just – it's it, it's across the entire nation, there is a total ignorance about this fruit. So I have a different uh, perspective. I, I grew up in a family where food was – really important. My mom, um, owned two restaurants growing up and she was a pastry chef. So I have a little bit more experience in that area, but I can, I would say, uh, generally speaking from, you know, family in Pittsburgh and everything like that. Um, I don't think it's as common simply because there's a lot of urban sprawl. So people just don't realize what they can grow. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just, there's not a whole lot of people in areas like that who are even growing their own food in general. Um, so they're at the mercy of supermarkets, you know? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs, which wasn't really, I would far, very far from a city. And I still, until I was about 21, 22, maybe 24, somewhere around there, didn't even really know that I could grow anything here. I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> I associated all my food with California. And um, even though there was an orchard, there is an orchard to this day, two minutes down the road. Um, just total ignorance. But um, let's go back a little bit to the capper figs and the, the intricacies here about them. Um, David, remind us all, what was the, the question that you said, the big question that you wanted to get answered? And that's a big mystery. You said you and your friend are, are oh we're on just it. you know we're studying these a little bit more we're broadening our horizon he loves to say stop calling your figs and start collecting you know if people or if collectors start realizing the potential of having a persistent capper fig in their collection to it really expands everything it's not um well a lot of our varieties especially now we have to uh, put either disclaimers on them because we're not sure how they'll perform outside of california it takes a year or so to um confirm whether or not they're calling them that's one of the wonderful things about figs it's we're not talking six years like other fruits uh, the potential is months I'm thinking um, Shasta, uh, not Shasta Star, but Shasta Cranberry, 547, gave a cutting to uh, Laguna Hills Nursery in January. In December, they had a seven foot tree with two ripe figs. One of them, the gentleman picked it. It wasn't completely ripe, and he says, Is this the right fig? I tasted it, and I was like, Wow, I want you your weather i want your zone because <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> what am i doing wrong that you're doing right seven foot from a cutting six inches and fruit but that's the potential of figs now with a capper fig um in your collection you can grow whatever you want as a collector 
and that really opens us up um, to some amazing flavors, amazing finds. Yeah, you don't have to be afraid um, mm. to try something new for fear that it, you know, might not be self-pollinating. So right, and we're talking about grafting stock. So yeah. I know you yourself, you talk about grafting. Capper figs are aggressive very super aggressive rooting um compared to we found compared to anything else i mean this is just a fresh fig all i personally do i'll even just clean it up a little bit stick that in dirt and i'll roll the dice and nine times out of ten it's gonna take I believe, or I should say we believe, it's just in their DNA. And something else that's special about the wild figs that we're coming across, they're survivors. Nobody's babied them. So these are trees that are growing. This was just growing in a culvert at a refinery that um, I can't say the soil's organic, if you know what I'm saying here. <laughs> you know, yeah. the odds wow. that this grew into a beautiful tree and produced fruit I want something like that for rootstock. I want something like that in my collection because the genetics are strong. And in the hobby of, um, I know that's kind of, people have touched on that, on breeding their own varieties. Hey, it's fun. Um, what I love, what we do, and I might get off, um, off topic a little bit, is I can do it as a family. I'm blue collar. I'm a working man. There's, at the end of the week on Friday, I'll have over 600 hours in 61 days. And that's 600 hours away from my family, staying down here in the um, 200 miles away from home. At least I can bring them home something, some fruit, <laughs> <laughs> some fig yeah. tree, something fun. But this is something even though there, we could do as a family to help us rebuild um, – our family cohesion, growing, as you well know, gardening, it's wonderful. My three-year-old hopping right. out there, daddy, daddy, look what we planted. We planted some loquat seeds and they're growing. And I'm like, I love loquats. <laughs> hey, I'm excited. <laughs> um, and anybody, uh, fig trees are just so easy. They can be grown in pots. Um, my mom just moved into a new apartment. We're going to see her for Thanksgiving. We're bringing up a fig tree. And she, the first thing she goes, I don't have a huge backyard. No problem. We're going to keep it in a little pot, a small pot. We'll, we'll do what it's necessary. It's an indoor plot, plant. It's not an outdoor plant. It'll be fine. Um, you know, David, it's, I was just going to say, it's pretty amazing. Like, I think a lot of people can relate to you and just what <laughs> you just said. I mean, uh, I don't think anybody needs any more convincing at that point. I mean, you, if you just listen to what David just said, you should plant yourself anything, really. But figs in particular are very easy, like you said. Um, they do root exceptionally easy when you just stick them in the ground. It's amazing how we go through all these hoops to uh, propagate our fig cuttings. But if you plant them in the ground at the right time, you know, it's it's just a simple it's a joke, really. Um, well, you know, and that's the. Go ahead. We've done it in plastic like bags with just a little bit of water in the bottom of the bag, just enough to keep some moisture. Like I have three bags hanging up on my mantle right now, so they're kind of like warm by the fireplace, and they're already starting to pop the lenticles on the, on the cuttings. So. <laughs> the I most mean, important yeah. thing that anybody could ever remember when it comes to fig cuttings. <laughs> is you have to clean them. Once you get them, use low peroxide, use a little bleach, little low, low, we're talking, but you have to make sure that you do not put any uh, mildew or mold or on that. That is the first and the easiest way to kill your cuttings. Other than that, moisture and heat. Heat of the soil, mm -hmm. you know, too much heat can kill it. Too little heat is it's not gonna grow. Too much moisture is gonna kill it. Not enough moisture. I mean, but you've got some excellent information on that on your videos. I mean, the, right. really want to hit one last. I mean, one one other major thing, and yeah. and again, it's I know it's a, <laughs> why I want to make sure everybody has a capper fig, 
is because I want to mm-hmm. share everything we find. <laughs> hey, I love sharing. My family loves sharing. Um, I, this is all wouldn't be possible without uh, the beautiful woman that I wish I was sitting next to 200 <laughs> miles away from me right now. Uh, she, she's amazing. I just have these like these ideas when I'm down here working and I say, Hey, is this possible? Can, can we do something cool? I got to share this. I, I think we sent you one. If not, we will. This is the first version, but they gave these away something like this at work. And I saw it and I was like, it's called a fun meter. It's got a dial that moves. <laughs> and, and it says medium, maximum. <laughs> and watching grizzly 70, not 70 year olds, but 60 year olds, 40 year olds, you know, guys that are putting in as many hours as I am get grumpy, then mess around with their fun meter. How you feeling? Oh, I, I'm okay. I saw it. This is cool. Everybody needs a fun meter when it comes to gardening because <laughs> we're having fun. Even when we <laughs> kill something, even when we kill something, we're learning, and that should be fun. And uh, yes, plus it's just cool it, giving away fun meters. Uh, you know, it's got a meter in my fig fun. I'm having a blast. <laughs> this is and, this is the energy I live with every day. <laughs> yeah, well, I is David? It. I feel like David's uh, one of those extreme extroverts that you just can't get him. Uh, you, us introverts, you just kind of like, okay, David, that's enough. I think I'm just going to fall asleep. Now. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. I think David, honestly, it's uh, you have this passion for figs, and that's that's amazing. I mean, most of the people I've been interviewing now have that passion. It's clear that you wouldn't be doing this. I think anybody wouldn't be doing this to your extent if you weren't passionate about it. And if somebody's passionate about anything, there's probably a good reason why. Um, even if it's something as boring as knitting, like, come on. <laughs> so, um. I just think uh, I think it's great. Um, now let's go back a little bit to the the intricacies of all of this. And so you mentioned that the question that you and your your guy that's really interested in capra figs is there. Tr- you you might be thinking that a capra fig you said can even self produce or produce offspring from just one standalone tree. Is that what you were getting at? Well, um, a persistent capra fig can produce viable seeds. That's really okay. And then those seeds, by the way, from just a self pollinating persistent capra fig, would they form a female fig? They could. Potentially? Well, that, that's what we're studying. That is kind of next on the list that we're really paying attention to. Now, this research, right. he came across this research, but for me, it's the explanation why. I'm a Y type of person. Um, again, in the construction field, you have a, a spot of this location, I start circling around. Here's a capper fig. I'll circle around that fig in the creek beds and I will find where that came from. Why in my circle? The why was important. The why is it, why why are we almost close to 1900? Why? Not everybody has a fig in their backyard. What about all these capper figs? In some locations of California, there seems to produce more capper figs. In some locations near us, we know one of the reasons why there's so many common varieties near us. And that's um, thankfully to uh, Leland Stanford. Uh, he, he had uh, started his collection up there. But the why, and this was um, a question I brought to him. And he says, hey, hold on a second here. And he brought up the research that um, I, I wish I had the exact information in front of me right now to quote it, but I can share it at a later point that states that it has been it, been done in a controlled environment. So if the fig wasp did not replace the seed and form a gall, and that pollen was in there and the fig wasp brought the pollen in, and that seed would be viable. So it has to do with the, the short and the long stamens. And the and the persistent capra fig you mentioned briefly is that you think you might think that it it's a genetic thing in that um, the fact that the 
uh, would you say that it was a it was a mutation of some of the other of the the non persistent yes. or the common fig was a was a mutation. So do you think you're thinking that the same mutation that happened with the common fig for it to form is in the same thing as the persistent fig, or is that not accurate? That that is accurate. That the persistent capper fig holds the genetic code for common figs. So they would be brother and sister. Interesting. So, so they for Very for good. more so, common and or that would go is if you're in an area fig hunting wise that has more persistent capper figs, then by virtue of that genetics circle, the fig wasps breeding with those uh, persistent using that pollen, that slowly that area will dial more towards the happy, happy, all common figs in that area. Okay. So David, you, you can or cannot produce viable seeds from a non-persistent capra fig. Will the, will the non-persistent capra fig only produce capra figs or will the non-persistent capra fig also produce female figs? I believe that test was only done with persistent, but that's something again, that's going to be on, on the list for, um, this year because it would be interesting to find out if you know the beginning of ficus carica did it start with non-persistent capra figs and then there was a mutation that then formed persistent capra figs which then formed all of the female figs that exist um is my thought process well let me blow your mind even further here um how about this they started out with capra figs and Females are a mutation. Right. Yeah, I don't know. So, I'm, that's that's what's so right. fun about this hobby is you can get down these little rabbit holes of what to do in the winter months. Well, and, and one of the things that, like, <laughs> to touch back on what David was saying with, with pollination and, and our area having more common fig seedlings as opposed to some areas – we're finding in the field that um, whether or not it's a persistent capper fig, um, whatever is the origin female type fig kind of is a good indication of what type of seedlings you'll get in that area. So like Fresno, um, you know, because that's a Smyrna area, that's what was planted in that area. A lot of the seedlings that they find in that area tend to be Smyrna or capra figs. So, whereas here, like Dave was saying, Leland Stanford, most of what he planted in his um, ranch were common figs, like mission and turkey figs. So, you're pollinating already common figs. So, most of the seedlings that we're finding in this area tend to be verified as common. That's incredibly useful. Um, and it's hopeful too for people that want to get into breeding. You know, because the standard knowledge is that it's 25%, right? The 25% of the seedlings that come up are male, 25 are San Pedro, 25 are Smyrna, 25 are common. But you're saying that's not the case uh, based on what you guys are seeing. And that, um, to me, is just a revelation because now it makes more sense to start doing some breeding, right? Like if I start out with a persistent capra fig, of my choosing for whatever reason. And then I also have a, um, a, f a female fig that's common of my choosing and breed them two together. Well, then I'm going to have a higher chance of actually getting what I want at the end of the day. Now I, I've always, maybe I've always, maybe. Okay. <laughs> maybe. Because if you go that... based on what we find out in the field, when you get into the odds yes. of it, it's like rolling the dice. We're playing the lottery. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know the, the article in the Smithsonian said it was the next best fig. That's not how we look at it. I mean, that's not how I personally, what I, and I, I'm not going to speak for Priscilla because she, she quotes Gilligan's Island a lot. <laughs> but it's, oh, for, that, yeah. for me, is going out on these adventures, it's not, we're going to find the next best one. I get to go hang out with my kids and go climb through <laughs> some bushes. Maybe we'll find something edible 
that we can share and, and enjoy and then share with the world. I mean, yeah. why not? Why not turn everybody into a fig lover? It, it is a super fruit. You yeah. know well, this, there, that a dehydrated something... fig... So, sorry, oh, Ross. God. You finished, David. Uh, de- God. God. Dehydrated fig um, is a superfruit. It has more vitamins than almost anything out there uh, um, per, per uh, mass. Per sorry. Yeah. I mean, it does. I don't know I the nutrition it. facts on figs, but it does make sense to me that they would have a lot of nutrients in them because the, the fig tree has this amazing ability to find water and nutrients unlike other trees. You know, they're, they're incredible in that way. And most trees and perennials typically have more nutrients in the, in the fruit and the food that they produce because they've been there for a longer period of time. They're able to get those minerals and all that good stuff in the soil and put that into the food. Um, so it makes sense, but, it does also, there is something to say, I think, about, you know, finding the next best fig, which obviously you said that's not your mission, but there are people actually out there, like my friend Eric Durchie, who I interviewed not too long ago, he was saying out of all the thousands, over a thousand fig varieties that he has tried, uh, of named varieties, some of seedlings, he has come to the realization that the best one was a seedling. Um in that it was amazing that it was a chance thing that never existed before. And so by you guys doing this, you are, even though maybe that's not your intention, you are contributing to humanity in this way um, to eventually improve the fruit as a whole. And so that's a big reason why I'm going around Philadelphia at this point and looking for you know, these trees that have been brought over by immigrants. And um, I found actually a number of trees this year. It's really exciting stuff. I talked to my friend Danny Gentile. He's he's the owner of FigBid. And uh, he was the one who kind of has that same passion as you guys have for finding these unknowns and preserving them. And um, But he did it in New York City. He was known as the fig guy in New York City. And uh, so I'm taking up that mantle in Philadelphia, and it's so far become very rewarding. I've already found at least 10 different varieties that look like they're quite unique. Um, Now, obviously, I don't know exactly what they are with the find out, but even just finding something unique is a challenge for me. You guys find something unique every day or every time you find these things. But for me, it's it's a nice bonus. We already know it's common. It's going to be unique, and so it's there for a reason. Someone took care of it. There's a lot of a lot of reasons why I think it's almost maybe not equally important, but certainly on the same level of importance of finding figs, not just where you guys are, but all over the country. Um, so, capper figs. Okay. And, and what? what are, hmm? Oh, good. And we do it as a community. That's what's so wonderful about our community is the communication from Eric to Dan Foster to Danny. I mean, if I said I had, yeah, we've had some chats about this, this subject. And um, this community is very warm and welcoming. <laughs> Good. I think, do you want to expand a little bit on that? Or is that just where you want to end it? Because... I know you said you wanted to touch a little bit on the community. Aspect. Well, I, I love it. And that's why we do the fig, the great fig giveaway on our website. There's mm-hmm. free cuttings. You pay for the shipping, you'll get some cuttings. Uh, we usually change it per month, but these are things you can kill or you can watch Ross and figure out the ways how to propagate them, how to craft them. He's got some great videos, um, how to do this stuff. And, you know, learn, fail or learn. We're just happy where we're at. You mentioned on some of the amazing figs, while we don't do that, I would put some of ours, and we have put some of our figs against some of the best. And well, Mm -hmm. we know that uh, it's just uh, figs are amazing. What can I say? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the main message, right? Is that just regardless, grow a fig and try to caprify it, and you're going to probably see great results. 
I mean, even if you don't caprify it, there's some really great options. Um, but I did get oh, to taste so your the Corazon de la Bahia is an incredibly, oh, okay. it's an incredible fig. Uh, the Cillin yeah. Dove is amazing. The Jolly Rancher is amazing. Uh, there's a number of them that I, I just couldn't, I didn't even believe sometimes what I was tasting. I was just like, that's in a fig, that, that flavor. And that's amazing too. I don't think we touched on that. And just the pollination somehow produces these amazing flavors, you know, um, you know, Eric Dirchie said it really well that I've tasted figs that are more like a cherry than a cherry. Um, mm -hmm. he's tasted figs that are more like this fruit than that fruit, you know? And so there, it makes the fig even more amazing that there's all this genetic diversity. There's all this amazing things to learn within the one, within this one fruit can represent a huge diversity of other fruits and also, you know, the fig itself, not even just to mention the different forms that a fig can take of drying them on the tree, semi drying them, fully drying them, the level of moistures that come out of them. Uh, you know, obviously you can do so many things with them in the kitchen. Um, yeah, it's just an amazing fruit. Do you have one last thing, David I, or Priscilla, either one of you guys that I want to just blow somebody's mind with when it comes to capra figs? Because um, we touched on a lot, and there's probably a lot of things that maybe people are like, okay, I don't know if I got this straight, but I need to rewatch and go back for a second. But if they got to this point, I'm, I'm assuming they're caught up. And so what is one that one thing maybe other than some of the other things you've already blown our minds about? But uh, if you could think of one more. Eat capra figs. Edible capra figs? Yeah. <laughs> Eat any of it. Any of it. Um, maybe I hear. Maybe I can give you a little bit of help. Um, maybe in the subject of breeding. So we talked a little bit on breeding on the phone. And so if I said, what, what makes a good capra fig for breeding? That's a good question. Uh, one that pro and, produces a, a, a lot of dry pollen and that's when you get some of the persistent figs um again we have edible capper figs that we are verifying that they're persistent or very high we highly sus suspect that um there are some that have a, a damp pollen that you have to pick a little early that aren't as excellent as others for breeding you want something that's kind of a, a dryish and, and plentiful too. You you want a lot of pollen. Interesting. So the pollen, by the way, um, I had a I have two capper figs that are grafted in my greenhouse and they survived the winter very easily and planted in the ground. Um, one of them this year produced an incredible amount of profici. Uh, probably, I don't know, 40, 50 figs, uh, which is nice for the size of it. And so every time I harvested each and every one, I mean, even them falling off the tree, it wasn't like I was prematurely picking them. They were definitely mature. It was that time. Uh, they even changed color a bit. They got soft. Um, but there was no pollen present inside the fig. So what does that mean exactly? Now, it's not edible. I know that for certain. Um, so that might not be a persistent one. Now, next year, when this happens, you're going to take your needle, your syringe, and you're going to blow a little air inside uh, at a stage during that time before they get ripe. And we're going to see if that actually stimulates the fig to stay on and continue to do what the wasp does, stir that insides up. There's some uh, science behind that. Now, persistent capra figs as well, uh, I'm glad I'm, we're talking about this because now I'm thinking of all these other questions. But these persistent capra figs, they're, they're somewhat edible. And so I've seen photos of persistent capra figs, and some of them even look somewhat tasty. And the pulp turns obviously like you would see in a female fig. But not all the persistent capra figs are, you know, you would somewhat enjoy to eat. Like there's a fig called uh, Krozik, I believe it's called that parts of it become somewhat edible and the, and the pulp is a bit jammy or jelly-like, like you would see in a female fig. But that wouldn't make a good fig for breeding, would it? Because you want that drier pollen. You don't want the fig to actually fill itself up with edible. Well, the, the edible crop will typically be the summer crop. 
So the perfici, which held the pollen, it would be the main crop in a common fig instead of the brava crop. And um, winter's gift, let's think this. Uh, the, the author that came down, and I'm not saying this, I'm sorry, I just had a, um, a brain. Jacob. A squirrel, <laughs> Jacob, he came down, we went out fig hunting, and we came upon a tree. It, we're in December, mind you, and this tree had ripe figs. Uh, I probably picked uh, a pound and a half, made a couple jars of jam, and we ate them. We called it winter's gift. You would, you, I still swear, today, it, you'd think it's a female fig. Come back in the springtime to check, to verify what the braid looked like. It had perfici. Mm -hmm. It was full of pollen. Um, wow. That's amazing. So, so yeah. Uh, that, that's, oh, man, that makes this even more complicated. <laughs> and that, and that, that winter crop, the, that December crop, it, it tasted like cantaloupe. Wow. Mm -hmm. And Avine's, so, Avine's first our daughter, um, that's something we do too, because our family, usually one of our kids be running around behind us, pulling the camera down, trying to get their attention. Um, I don't know if she, she gets <laughs> that, um, is we'll use their names and they're avid fig hunters in their own, including at their school. They found them in the bushes at their, their schools here. So uh, Avine's first she saw it at a car wash and she was like, mommy, mommy, I'm working in the Bay Area. Priscilla tells me, hey, uh, Avian found a fig. And I didn't believe her. And then I looked and there was a fig. Well, that's actually a completely edible capper fig, meaning it tastes just as delicious um, as a female fig. And it's we know... The crop right now is... Um the edible crop. Like I've picked yeah. some in the last several weeks and eaten them. Wow. And the other thing here, this is, this just keeps going. Like my mind just like, okay, well, this is somehow taking me somewhere else. But, um, this, you know, the, the persistent capper figs you theorize could potentially create their own. They could be self pollinating, excuse me. So the, the persistent capper figs could be self pollinating if I were to have a persistent capper fig in my yard or in a container here, and that would be true, then I could potentially even have a bird maybe peck one of the persistent capper figs, or even I could take the seeds out myself and propagate figs potentially from that. Or is that not true? We'll have to find out. I mean, that, that right. that's... Theoretically, that could be the case. Theoretically, the chances are, are, are there. <laughs> Which... yeah, there was a fig many years ago on Figs for Fun that uh, a grower in California named uh, Carla Oz. She actually has a website, Garden Crochet, by the way, if anyone's interested. She's a really nice woman. Um, she spread this variety around um, called Cuervo Oscuro, I think it's called. It's a persistent capper fig that looked pretty tasty, actually. And so... I know a lot of people at some point, because she spread these these cuttings around, a lot of people ended up growing it. And I don't know how many people still are, but it would be interesting to see from those people if they've noticed anything interesting. Because without a capra fig, and I, I don't know if we really established this, which is kind of crazy, but maybe we should have done that in the beginning, is that without the fig wasp or without a self-pollinating persistent capra fig, theoretically, um, you cannot propagate figs. You cannot. I cannot take the seeds out of my female figs and germinate them, and they'll turn into a fig. So that's why around here, where the the blastophaga is not present, uh, that's why we don't see the wild seedlings popping up all over the place like you guys do in California. Uh, I see mulberry seedlings popping up all over my yard, you know. Um, but it's the same thing. If we had that mechanism in in place to actually propagate these figs uh it would they would be all over the the, the country um so it's almost like david wants everybody to spread figs all over the country oh yeah <laughs> he does and have them invasive in a way there's so many people watching right now that are like this is so invasive um 
and they just get their pants in an uproar. What do you, what do you say to those people? I mean, Priscilla, I think you should go because I think David maybe is having a, a little connection issue. I mean, anything can be invasive if if left unchecked, but. Yeah. I mean, if if you love figs and you want to, you know, create your own food, mm -hmm. why not? Like, right. I mean, you know, I have mint that's invasive, but I cut it yeah. back every year, keep it contained, and yep, and it's fine. Like, it stays where it's supposed to be. I, a fig tree will do the same thing. Right. I think people are mainly concerned with the ecosystems and the forests and things, and they get all uptight about it but you know there's so many invasive things that already exist it's just like why is a fig really your biggest concern um to me i don't it's think it is me. personally and in fact <laughs> i would rather have edible invasive things you know that that'd be a great thing obviously there's wild grapes and wild raspberries and blackberries all over the place around here right and so those are definitely a problem the grapes you know they climb up the trees and they kill these big trees but that's part of nature in a way, you know, I mean, killing these trees, bringing them to the ground is only helping them recycle their wood and help them mycelium and, and all different parts of the soil. And that I recycling it, process is actually important. Right. It's all part of the cycle, you know, so. Yeah. So Priscilla, I know see David's having some problems, but you know what? Um, we're getting close to that time anyway. So maybe if David... I'm here. Can speak or you could speak, hey, but so you are okay. So the problem is that we have food desert. <laughs> That's what the problem is. Not 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 wild figs. Yeah. If everybody has a fig tree, just sharing, uh -huh. and that's why we we came up with the Fig Hunter Club, is because we just want to share and just want everybody to have a fig tree and be part of the club. It's a big club. Yeah. I don't know. Well, well said. Um, <laughs> you mentioned um, we're about done. I realize that. I'm sorry. I had a little bit of a um, a break. Oh, it's okay, David. No. no worries. Do you want to say anything else on the invasive part of it? Or um, I was going to give you guys the opportunity to wrap it up um, and plug anything you guys want to plug, anything you want to close on and, and, uh, and do that kind of thing. Um, on the invasive part of it, naturalization, maybe it's just the fig is now, um, naturalization. I mean, naturalizing to, uh, spreading. I mean, is that a bad thing? I'm realizing the Smithsonian, there was, um, some biologists that, uh, discussed, in that uh, magazine, that article, how it's pushing out native plants. Would those native plants still be dying? And may are they already dying? And is the fig place, the fig tree, just filling a food source? Or um, right on our property, all our oaks are dying from um, sudden oak illness or disease and we're replacing them with fig trees. So we're replacing a tree for a tree. I love my oak trees. I just don't have a hundred years to let them grow. <laughs> I, I want to make right. it green <laughs> sooner than that. Right. And I get something to eat. So. Mm -hmm. um, you said some shouts out, uh, some wonderful people that we've met in this adventure. Uh, Danny Gentel. The fig bid. Mm -hmm. I love our discussions, Danny. Um, Mr. Dan Foster, amazing man. Uh, very uh, generous quality. Uh, Charles Malky of uh, Ivy Organic. He has been just a cheerleader in our corner when we had some ideas. Uh, everything um, yourself, I mean, discussions. Uh, my wife, my wife without her. Without her sitting there, she, she is just, uh, she really is. Most times when you deal with somebody, you honestly deal with her uh, because, and she's amazing. Um, and my family, I mean, without them, this, this adventure wouldn't be any fun. Right. 
So, I guys, was- I, I really appreciate David and uh, Priscilla for joining us here today. It's been really uh, an eye-opening talk. I really appreciate you guys coming on here and teaching us all. I learned something. Everybody, I'm sure, learned something. And uh, I really do thank them for coming. Check out their website, thefighunter.shop. Um, and uh, we'll catch you guys for the next one, all right? Uh, check out our blog as well, figboss.com. Oh, David, you want to say something? There was one other thing. There's, there's, if you want to yeah. find out your varieties, because I know uh-huh. he's a huge fan of you, Ross, is Lance over at figvarieties.com. Yeah. Yeah, Lance is great. I love Lance. I got to give a shout out because his support through, through us has um, been amazing too. And uh, All right. Well, there you go, Lance. You got it, man. Um, I got to have him on here at some point, by the way. You know, Lance would be a great guest. But um, anyway, guys, thank you again for watching. We'll see you guys for the next one, all right? Take care. Yeah, that's all. Have a good one. Bye.